Hello and welcome to our service dog handler chat, holiday edition. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about how public access can change or impact what we do with our service dogs and our young service dogs in training. So we're going to look at a couple of different topics and I will give some basic information on that topic and then I'll ask for opinions from other handlers that are here and then we'll move on to the next topic. So the first topic that we're going to address is young service dogs in public places. Um, so this is really service dogs in training, but also even younger adults and you know, so Azul is two and a half. He's considered an adult, but he still could have some issues with distractions in his entering in our environment. So you want to consider a couple of different things when you're thinking about, do you want to take your service dog in training out for a training session during the holidays? Number one is crowds. The stores that the crowds in stores almost double between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Um, more people are have time off. If they have the week off, they may be going nuts with their kids at home. So you see a lot more teenage, I don't want to say children, teenage people <laughs> running in the store, maybe in small groups and playing games. And if that happens once, you can use it for your training as a distraction. But when that happens nonstop during your training session, it can easily overstimulate your dog. So an example of some teens messing around in a store, which I mean, I get it. They're teens. I was a teen once. And so they were kind of playing a game of Marco Polo which my service dog at the time knew. I always used to play this with my kids when they were older and they kind of would, I would trust them a few aisles away looking at something or some, you know, and I was ready to move on to the next part of the store. I would say, Marco, and then they would reply, Polo, and come find me. <laughs> so, I mean, I did it. I wasn't obnoxious, but this time with the service dog, it was a bit different from another side of point of view when they were playing they were also kind of not really jogging but speed walking to see who could find the person first and coming from all sorts of sides of the store so they could pass us at any given moment and you know they weren't causing any problems they were happy and not being destructive and I was cool with that and I could use it as a training situation but Christmas time tends to add that along with a lot more little kids and a lot of people who are just a little bit argumentative or angry because they're frustrated with the crowd in the store and they want to just run in and grab a few things. So the whole feel of the crowd, um, not only do the numbers double with the amount of people in those environments, but the general atmosphere of the environment also changes. So if we have a dog that is either going through a fear period or on the slightly anxious side to begin with, it really is a good idea to maybe just take a break during the holiday period and don't do any public access. Unless you know that you can pick like specific days of the week if you can go earlier on a Monday or Tuesday during the work week and when kids are still in school you know if you can plan your training session like that you may be okay I would avoid weekends I mean even now and not because of Azul but just because of me I avoid going into public places on the weekends if I can <laughs> so we've been needing to go to the grocery store for three days and we've been putting it off till this evening just because we wanted our best chance of the lowest crowd possible. The other thing to consider is um, if you are going to the store because you're doing Christmas shopping, you know, some of us will gather with friends or family and do like an all day Christmas shopping kind of marathon. And if you're doing that, that might be a good day to leave your young service dog at home and use a service human to help you during those things. Or if um, you're doing a short, outing you know maybe you're just running into Walgreens because they have these one Christmas ornaments you like or they sell this one Christmas candy the cheapest or something like that so you're going in for one item you know 
then you might take a service dog in training in for that. But when you do, expect only basics. Don't work on anything new that you've been teaching your service dog and just expect the basic obedience, allowing them to scan the environment a little bit more and helping them to really feel safe in that environment versus trying to train specific things in that environment. So I just want to take a minute, and I know Lulu has a great story about crowds and stores and craziness that just impacted her. Um, so you don't have to share Lulu if you don't want to, but if either of you want to share a story of your experience with crowds in stores or any of your best tips for crowds in stores, go ahead. And Lulu, you can be first. So I had a really crazy incident happen at the Dollar Tree today. Um, I did get mad at Tofu, my service dog in training, until I realized, because another customer had told me about what this woman was doing in the store. She was on the other side of the store, so I didn't really hear her or see her when this happened. Um, apparently, she decided she needed to get on her stomach on the floor. I'm not sure why. And she was boofing or barking uh, really low enough that I didn't hear her. And she was calling Tofu over to her. He was in a nice downstay. He wasn't doing anything. So I didn't figure anything until he pulled me down because he went to run over to her. Oh, that was fun. That was fun. Not. And then I did tell her I had to leave the store. I went out of the store, calmed Tofu down, and then I went back in and I told her she was distracting him, you know, it, she shouldn't do that. And then she got mad and told me that if he's not allowed to play with other people, he shouldn't be in the store. Oh, I, I hate it when they do that. Just a horrible incident. So just be careful for those crazy shoppers. Um, they get a little more crazy during the holiday season as well. Totally. Um, <sighs> you know, with our service dogs, we can have people doing stupid stuff to them all the time. And there's a point to training with that. But then there's a point where you just got to chalk it up as, no, that person went really, really overboard. And just forgive your service dog mistakes. Um, Greta, do you have a story you want to share or no? Um, well, I don't take Cassie out a whole lot right now, but the last time I took her out, um, I, I, it, it was before I had my surgery, but um, I, was, I was using my manual chair and she was doing really good in the store and then somebody calls her over and, you know, she was only about four and a half, five months at that time. Um, and she turned sideways into the wheelchair, got her foot, caught her foot in the manual chair. So she hurt herself because she was coming to this person and this person then started yelling at me because she got ran over by the wheelchair. It was a manual chair, so it wasn't like the big heavy power chair. But if she would have just butted out, that would have never happened. But she made a point to call Cassie over there and make a big deal about it. And if she would have just butted out, nothing would have happened to start with. And then they, you know, fuss at us. So, yeah, I get irritated with people like that. People always think it's our fault. And, you know, granted, we do have to take a little bit of responsibility for having dogs in stores if they're not trained well enough to be there. But accidents happen, and when people call our dogs away from us, it can very easily hurt our dogs. But she purposely went out of her yeah. way, like like what happened with her the other girl, Lulu. Um, she purposely was calling Cassie, calling her, and everybody was like, "Don't do that. She's a service dog in training. You're not supposed to mess with them." They don't care. People don't care. Right. That's one of the reasons I've like went out of the way to condition words like, um, so Azul and I hear all the time, the dog's so beautiful, he's so handsome, what gorgeous, and look at those eyes. And so anytime Azul he hears those things, when he was younger, I heavily reinforced focus on me for hearing those words from other people. 
And to this day, when he hears those words, he smiles up at me and gets closer to me and gets that stronger focus. And so that allows us to either get out of the situation or what he's really hoping for is to go say hi, but he knows he's not going to do it unless I have focus first. So sometimes we will then go say hi if we have time. And that reinforces his little for his focus even more, which is why we still do it. But yes, it's really, really important to realize people are going to mess with you more during the holidays than they do regularly. And so it might just be a good reason to leave your service dog in training at home or even your young service dog, especially if you're doing something like Black Friday sales. I do not, would not, take a service dog into Black Friday sales environments. So, you know, there's the possibility with Azul being fully trained, if we were only going into a store in the afternoon and I had previous experience with that store and expected it to be on the quieter side in the afternoon, you know, and Azul is rock solid in public. So I might consider that. But if I were going out at 5, 6 a.m. when all the crowds are out, there's no way I would take him into that chaos. You have to make choices when you have a service dog, and sometimes that's the hard choice of leaving that dog at home. One other thing I want to touch base on specifically around um, public places is the desensitization and counter conditioning. So we all, especially with young dogs, love to work around the holiday decorations, the Christmas trees and whatnot, which is fun and it makes good pictures and everything and that's cool. But we don't think to desensitize to other winter things in the store. So especially if you live in a colder climate like I am in, um, everybody starts wearing heavy winter coats and they make a different noise, especially if somebody's Russian. Everyone starts wearing winter boots and I don't know what they're called these days, but in my day, we called them moon boots, the big, thick, padded boots that slide on and clunk around when you walk. And so kids wearing those, especially if that kid seems to be running toward your service dog, even when they're not, you know, if they're approaching your service dog, those boots make a heck of a lot more noise than regular shoes do. And that can be very scary. So we kind of want to look around at what are people doing differently? You know, are they, um, maybe they have a heavier purse or bag slung over their shoulder than they wouldn't normally carry because they have to carry more supplies in the winter. Maybe they, the carts are squeaking a little bit more because they've left, been left out in the parking lot with snow. Or maybe that means the Snow is melting off the carts as they're rolling through the store, so we're more likely to stumble across water along the floor that our dogs might be um, wanting to sniff or lick or something to that effect. So we need to really keep in mind not only the holiday decorations that could be scary, there's a lot of other things that maybe our dogs are not desensitized to. Um, winter hats. I wear a winter hat all the time when I go outside because I have to or my ears bother me. But I wear just a basic, straight, you know, normal winter hat. And there's a lot of other people that wear other types of hats. Um, we have the Stormy Cromers here that have the big ear flaps. Thankfully, my son has that. So as well as used to seeing that as well. But if you're walking outside, you might see ski masks or scarves which may not be as big now that we've had COVID days and most of our dogs are used to face masks in some places. But previous to COVID, that used to be a big scare. So I just highly suggest you look around to any um, thing that's new in the winter that you wouldn't normally see in the other types of years. If your dog is less than two years old, they've only experienced that once or never if your weather is just changing. So kind of take that into effect. Do either of you have something unusual you've desensitized your service dogs in training to? Go ahead. Um, those big gloves that the 
Um, I'm not really sure who takes care of the wires outside. Gotcha. Tofu was extremely scared of the gloves. The guy actually took the glove off and Tofu was like, oh, you can pet me now. He put the glove on and Tofu was like, what is that thing? <laughs> So they I had to go buy some. Thicker, thicker, and you know, they're almost more like um astronaut gloves, you know, <laughs> just yep. big and huge. And I'm sure they smelled. So that might have had a big thing to do with it, is the way they smelled. If we remember, we see things with our eyes, but our dogs see things with their nose and ears more and less with their eyes. So <laughs> probably had a smell there. Um, Greta, anything unusual for you? Uh, yeah, baseball hats. Cassie didn't like baseball hats. Every time my brother come in, she'd freak out with the baseball hat. Um, she She's not so bad anymore. She don't mind them now. That is a big one, though, and the hats do change in the winter, so we see more baseball hats mm -hmm. in the summer. That's something to keep in mind if you start doing public access with her again, is that yeah. the are going to be different, and she might need some desensitization for that. Yeah. So moving on to our next topic, I want to kind of look at family activities and how that might change for holidays. And so we all know, um, we all have our different holiday traditions, whether it's going to Graham's house for Thanksgiving dinner or, you know, whatever it is. But so we may have had our dog at small family gatherings or maybe a a few people coming over to our house before or we've gone to somewhere else. But bigger family gatherings can be really overwhelming for our dogs. And so we tend to want to keep our dogs close to us in situations like that. A, so that they can work. B, so that they can focus a little bit better. And then C, so that family isn't um, encouraging bad habits. But when we have a really, really large gathering and we do that, we can also add stress to our dogs. And um, during our whole dog approach Zoom with the fairy dog mother, she had really said of something that hit home that I always do, but I don't know that I've always thought to share with my other teams. And that is make sure that your dog has a safe place that they can get away from the crowds, whether that's a bedroom or another room, that you can shut them in. You can always take your crate if they're crate trained or a special blanket. Azul has a blanket that he likes for situations like that. And, you know, a lot of us being disabled, we need that time to just kind of come down as well. So maybe it's just you and your dog going in a different room and sitting on a couch or on a bed for 10, 15 minutes. But make sure you're giving your dog that time whether you take it or not. Um, also consider if the gathering is really, really large, it might be one where you, especially if your responsibilities at that gathering are large, it may be easier to leave your dog at home for that. Um, so one of the biggest questions and like emergency calls I get from clients is, you know, so-and-so had this happen and we went there to help them. You know, my relative had surgery. We went down to help them. So now I'm cooking dinner and cleaning their house and my service dog is going crazy because they don't know what to do. So we have to kind of think about that too, in which um, our dogs are in a new environment and they may not, they may settle at home on a mat or they may settle at home on the couch or whatever while you cook dinner. But when you go into that new environment, if your expectations or responsibilities in that new environment are huge, your dog might struggle a little bit more with figuring out what to do. And so I like to say, you know, if, you're, if your whole goal is to be at that family function to socialize and your dog is comfortable with doing that, you know, then take your dog. But if your goal is to entertain all the kids because that's the role you've fallen into for the past few years or cooking a big part of the dinner or whatever the case may be. If you have a huge responsibility, you may want to consider leaving your younger dogs home if they're not ready to handle that. 
Um, that goes along with the next one too, is consider your dog's experience. Have you built them up slowly or are you rapidly making a huge jump in their training? So, you know, if you're building them up slowly and you think they're ready, that may be good, but it's not worth the frustration it causes our dogs and us as their handlers to push them into a situation that is more than what they're ready for. So just consider their experience and how they are going to enjoy that family gathering because if they're not enjoying it and comfortable, you're not going to enjoy it and be comfortable either. So the last thing I want to talk about, and this is where we may have more opinions <laughs> with this section, is um, your family's reaction to your service dogs. So it's one thing if everybody's coming to your house for dinner. Of course, your service dog is going to be there because it's your house, it's your dog's house. But if you're going to somebody else's house for dinner, it's not a place of public accommodation, it's a private residence. So A, you don't have permission to just take your dog there. And if you've talked to the homeowner and they have given you permission, you also may wanna consider what are some of the other family members going to think about that? And how is that gonna impact your holiday? So I always say, well, thankfully, I have a really, really open and welcoming family when it comes to stuff like that. However, there's one or two people that have strong opinions, and you may have a family with more than that, about where dogs should go or what dogs should be doing. Um, for example, my son-in-law was always raised that dogs aren't anywhere near the table. Well, then my service dog is trained to talk under my feet or under my chair at the table. So the very first um, Thanksgiving dinner that we had with Azul in his house, that became a problem only because we hadn't discussed it ahead of time. Now, my son-in-law is very supportive of Azul being a service dog, but it wasn't expected for him. And so if we had just had that conversation beforehand, we could have saved a little bit of strife, which it wasn't bad. We reasoned it out like two adults and we found something that worked for us. But if you know you have a family member that is going to be hesitant about it, my advice is always talk to them before the day so they know what's expected and you know what's expected. And then you can save that big family blow up at your family dinner you know, you can save some issues. Does anyone else have anything that they want to add as far as family reaction and things you may want to consider? If there's a lot of kids there, be prepared um, that your service dog may want to just play with them. <laughs> Izzy, um, so my sister always invites me and Izzy and she invited me, Izzy and Tofu. I would not do that because Izzy and Tofu are pretty big dogs and they all just love playing with the kids and the kids will just run around. Unfortunately with Tofu, he'll just like, he's very <laughs> clumsy. He's not like Izzy, so he'd probably be like playing and then knock everything off. Um, and a lot of- good to consider. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, at a whole new excitement level. And if our dogs can't handle that excitement, are likely to become overexcited or likely to cause issues with bumping into furniture or knocking kids over, that can be a safety thing and also cause our family members to reconsider whether they ever want them to come back in their home or not. So, yeah, that's a very good one. Did you have anything else, Lulu? Um. Sometimes uh, there are more than just my sister's kids. So she has five kids and there are like three or four extra kids. Now the extra kids, uh, they usually get invited to the holiday stuff because they don't prepare for it. So they'll ask my sister if they can come over. Then when my sister says, yeah, my sister's here with her dog, they get really huffy puffy. They still come over and then they're just like, 
they'll yell at Izzy and stuff. And Tofu hasn't been near them during the holidays yet, but he probably won't be because I just don't want to put up with them being like, ah, there's a dog here. Why is there a dog here? Shouldn't the dog be locked up in the bathroom? It, it gets really annoying. <sighs> Definitely. I can see that. And, you know, sometimes it is just better to leave the dog home and use a service human. It does kind of depend on, like, my rule of thumb always with my dog is if something is bad, I'm prepared to leave. You know, whether that's leave into a different room of quiet or pack up in the car and leave. And, you know, I apply that to parades, to, you know, outdoor concerts that are free for the community or anything. Um, if I'm there trying to socialize or train my dog and there's an issue, we will back off and move away or pack it up and go home. I don't want to keep my dog in a bad experience environment because that can really hurt their training long term as far as any time they're in that environment, it can cause those same emotions to come out. So I want to make sure that I'm prepared to leave if my dog is struggling for any reason. And I do that for shopping and everything I take my dog into. And we also need to think that, you know, it's if we're going to grandma's house for dinner, and grandma is getting up there in age we don't and we're worried about how many more years we're going to be able to do that with grandma so we really want to be there and we don't want to miss it it might be a good time to leave your dog at home because you won't be prepared to just walk out if you need to Breda, do you have anything else you want to add all right then I have one last kind of topic and it's something to consider that goes along with family activities and um, public access. Because we're used to thinking, you know, um, we know if we go into a person's home, it's not ADA laws. There are a few exclusions to ADA that a lot of people don't know about and may not think about when it comes to holiday gatherings. So one of the big places, and I have a family gathering coming up that I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to yet or not, but it is in the um, family room or gymnasium kitchen area room of a church. And so churches and any religious organization or facility are not covered under ADA because of the separation of church and state. So even if it's a, um, maybe it's a soup fundraiser or a craft bazaar or something to that effect that is taking place in a church building, you don't automatically have permission to take your service dog to that just because of the building. It might be open to the public, but the building itself is not covered under ADA. So you need to ask permission before you take your service dog or service dog in training to anything in a religious facility. Another big one that people often don't think of are clubs such as the Lions Club, um, VFWs, Legion Halls, anything like that that is membership based and not open to the general public they also are not covered under ADA. So you can't, even though you might be going with a member to one of those clubs, to one of their events, unless the club has approved your access to bring the service dog, you don't necessarily have access. So if you can request that before the event is much better than showing up at the door and then asking. It can be really hard with churches because most churches, especially in my area, are open to it, but they don't, when you ask the question, they don't know who can approve it. You know, does the pastor have authority to approve it? Does it have to go out to the deacons to approve? You know, they just, they simply don't know because it, they haven't had a whole lot of experience with it. And so it may be hard to get an answer from those clubs as to whether it's okay or not okay. So... You can just show up and hope they approve it on site, but then you better be prepared to leave if they say no, because it's not an ADA 
place. Another thing where a lot of family activities do gather are restaurants. You may have a reserved room or always go to a back corner or something. And that is covered under ADA. But I do want to just remind you that while you could let them know ahead of time that you're bringing a service dog, there is no reason to ask them if it's okay or not because they are covered under ADA. And even if they verbally give you permission, say you're in a state where service dogs in training don't have access and you have a service dog in training, not fully trained yet, and you call to ask them if it's okay to bring them in, that permission violates the local health codes in that area. They can't legally give you that permission. So it doesn't mean anything legally. Um, it might make you feel better. And, you know, if it that's the type of thing, you know, I have asked one person about bringing Azul into the restaurant. And that's only because the restaurant owner was a good friend from years and years ago, and I didn't want to cause any harm to his business versus, you know, like bad opinions. I didn't want his staff to be unprepared for it. And I just wanted to know his take on it before I took his will. And yes, I had access, but I knew I didn't want to fight because he was a friend of the family for years and years and years. And so I messaged him ahead of time. And just so you know, I'm passing through town. I'm stopping to have dinner with a few friends. I'll have my service dog. Is that going to be a problem? Do you need to know ADA laws now? You know, what can I do to make this go more smoothly? Or would you prefer me not to come? And he was like, oh, yeah, service dogs are welcome. No problem. My staff will handle it just fine. And I did have one staff member, like, constantly try to get Azul's attention and want to pet Azul during dinner. And I'm like, I'm sorry, he's working. Will you please stop? And yes, I knew her from back when I lived in that area too. So I knew her well. And I'm like, he can't say hi to you right now. So if you could just ignore him while we eat. When we leave, if you want to follow us outside, you're more than welcome to say hi to him out there. <laughs> and, you know, it was that kind of thing. And she did kind of take a moment to step outside at the end. But it's kind of important that we realize in our heads that we can ask them for permission but it doesn't really mean anything. Restaurants are part of ADA. The other thing we may want to consider with that is how is that going to make our family members feel? If we have family members that are kind of on the fence over like maybe, especially a lot of us with individual or individual, invisible disabilities, our family members may not think we're disabled enough. And if they've never gone out to dinner with us and our service dogs in a quieter setting, they may be very, very nervous with us taking our service dog into a restaurant with the whole family. I was a bit worried about this the first time Azul did it with my family members because he was used to being around them all outdoors. We do big camping trips every summer. So he was used to them being able to socialize and have fun and whatever when we were there for the whole weekend, you know, kind of when he was off duty, but they hadn't actually seen him on duty in a public place. And so before our big dinner at the restaurant, I had taken the few people that I wondered and made sure that they had gone into like local stores or whatever with the service dog so that they could see his manners in public and that it was okay so that they weren't so nervous before we went to the big dinner. So there's a couple of little things that we can do to help our family members be more prepared for the gatherings if we do plan on taking our service dogs. Do you guys have any other um, places that may be not covered under ADA or places, specific places where you've had more challenges with taking your service dog? I know I haven't taken Azul into a church yet. Um, he would handle it just fine because he's so good with public access. But if I do decide to go to the Christmas party that's a family thing at a church, I will call and make sure that they know he's coming first. But if an eight hour drive away is my hesitancy. It's not going, I'd love to go, but it's eight hours away. <laughs> so. 
Lou, do you have something you want to add there as far as public access challenges or places we might want to consider? I had a friend ask me, I'm not sure if they're covered under the ADA or not. So there's this, the, I think it's the Lions Club or the VA that puts this on. Um, they rent out a building and then they set up a bunch of different Christmas trees and they allow people to go in there and look at all the different lights, decorations on the trees and all of that. She asked me if her dog would be allowed. And I'm like, I have no idea. I've never been to one. That is kind of the question. So if it's at a Lions Club facility, then they're not covered under ADA and you have to have permission. But like, for example, um, the Festival of Trees that I used to go to long ago, it was in a gymnasium that was at our old armory that was kind of refurbished into a city hall type thing. So that's a public building and he had uh, then ADA would cover that. So you kind of have to look at that. It doesn't matter if there's a club hosting it, if it's in a place that would normally be public access. But if it's in a place that they own and they maintain that, you know, is not open to the public, then you would have to ask for permission, even if that particular okay. event was open to the public. Yeah, when she asked me that, I was like, well, I have no idea. I know stores have to let you in. Um, and normally the VA doesn't really give me issues bringing Izzy and now tofu in there anyway. I have nothing to do with the VA. I just go in and let people pet my dogs. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so they the don't VA care. itself, the building that the VA is in is considered federal property and they do yeah. not fall under ADA. Most of them do have very similar rules, but they usually want to, um, either assign a badge or something to the effect of, yes, this dog has been approved type thing. Not all of them do, but they usually want Yeah, they give us a little sticker to put yeah. on the leash or their vest or whatever. Um, I think it's because so many people who go there know me and know my dogs are really friendly and they're pretty much well behaved for the most part. But I'm not it's so almost sure. more of stepping into the role of therapy dog in that situation. If your goal is to go in and socialize, they're actually acting more like therapy dogs than service dogs. But Oh yeah, they make so many people happy. And I think that's the other reason the VA doesn't really say anything to me much besides they give us the sticker that says you're a visitor and that's about it. I mostly stay right. where the waiting room area thing is and that's it. Yeah, and that's a really good thing that to consider is what is the goals that we have for our dog in that situation? Is it a goal where we just want them to be able to socialize and get a little bit more friendly with strangers or even just reinforce that they're friendly with strangers that it's an older dog? You know, those can be great opportunities. But Definitely. we really need to consider what is our goal for that situation versus... There's if, also if a lot of people who have walkers, canes, wheelchairs, and crutches that are in there as well. That's one of the biggest reasons I take tofu is so he can get used to the medical equipment. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one as well. And that falls into making sure we know why we're there. Because if our goal is specifically to do training, then we may want to I don't want to say be standoffish, but be more reserved and maybe hold still in a quiet corner and watch things versus if it's to go in and actually socialize and be with people, you know, we're going to maybe set that up a little bit differently based on what our expectations are for the day. Greta, do you have any places or things that you think would be good to consider? No, I don't have really anything to add. All right, then. So I did have just one last topic, and it's actually going to lead into what we are looking at next week in our chat. So the chat next week is um, 
public access challenges. And I know uh, that's going to go into more of, you know, how to address challenges when they happen. But I thought this week it might be kind of good to throw in, since we've already been talking about specific holiday gatherings, common places that we might be more likely to get an access challenge. And so I have kind of a short list that I created with brainstorming, and I'm sure there's a bunch more. But so if you think about, you know, most of our stores, especially if we've been training in them, they've seen us, you know, we're not going to really get a whole lot of access from stores. Same with hospitals. If we've been there and if they've seen us before the holidays, they're not really going to challenge us much on the holidays. But we then sometimes will go into other buildings that may not be our normal buildings and they may not be familiar with service dogs. Like Lulu pointed out, the building with the Festival of Trees. Um, if we're looking at a city building, perhaps, um, yes, they're owned by the city, but they're not separate like federal buildings are. So they are still covered under ADA. But the chances of them having a service dog walk in previously before you on any given day is fairly low. You know, unless you're in a really populated area, um, you know, where Cindy is in California, there's service dogs all over the place. And so they may be more familiar with it. But in my more rural area, where there's probably less than 10 service dogs within a 30 minute drive time radius, any direction. <laughs> so a lot of the smaller places like town halls where, you know, they maybe they have a Christmas tree lighting and the um, city hall is open for bathroom purposes, but then you have to use the bathroom and wanna take your service dog in. And they're like, oh, no dogs in the building. They're thinking pets and not really realizing it, but so that's a really common place where we may have excess challenges. Um, again, most of us would carry the ADA laws on our phone and can kind of point it out, but do we want to do that when we need to get in and use the bathroom? <laughs> so just kind of keep that in mind and it may not be a bad idea to introduce your service dog to the people that are in charge of that building early on in the event so that if they see you in the building later on, they know exactly who you are and why you have a dog in there and that it's not a pet. That's one of the things that I will do is I will just kind of watch the doorway and see if there seems to be one person that's, you know, maybe checking on things, making sure people know how to find the bathrooms and making sure, you know, when you see that one person, we might kind of consider them a gatekeeper in the service dog world, but that's not really their role. Their role is to make sure everyone has a successful event. And so I will go up and introduce myself and my dog to that person so that they know they're a service dog. They see the manners. They probably watch us a little bit more when we're through the crowd, but I'm okay with that. And then when we do need access to that building, they're a lot less combative that way. So that's my approach. Another one for things like that tend to be family owned, especially seasonal businesses. So we have a lot of locally owned um, small family businesses in our community, but seasonal businesses pop up even more, you know, maybe a candle shop, maybe a Christmas tree yard, um, all kinds of different things, maybe even a gift shop that's only open during the holidays. Those Small family owned businesses very, very often don't understand ADA law and are much more likely to give you an access issue than say Walmart or Target or you know any of the bigger stores that have corporate policies that address service dogs. A family owned store or business doesn't have a corporate policy. They have owners and owners seem to be much more passionate about their business. So pet friendly place in my area, you know, they're a lot more opening. Even if it was a pet, they would probably let them in just because everybody loves dogs here. But if you're in a family owned or seasonal business in a busier community where maybe everyone isn't so dog friendly, that can be a really 
big place for access issues. So you kind of just want to be aware of that. The other thing is schools. Um, a lot of schools, there's fundraising events, craft bazaars, and things like that to help students raise money for school expenses. You know, the band might put on a craft show or different, different groups in school might do that. And so the two things to look for, if it is a student of that only, so like a um, high school dance or a wrestling practice or something to that event that is student only, then you don't necessarily have permission to take your service dog unless your service dog has already been approved by the schools. Because in that situation, schools are not covered under ADA. When that changes is when that event is open to the public. So even though you may not have permission to take your dog into the gym to watch a basketball practice, you know, that's open to students. Games are usually open to the general public. So that would be covered under ADA but like craft shows and soup fundraisers and things like that that are happening in a school gym, as long as they're open to the public, they're covered under ADA. So you can take your service dog in without asking questions. However, a lot of times those events are manned by volunteers. There's always a few adult volunteers standing around. And if one of them happens to be at the door, they're most likely to question you and say, no dogs are allowed in school. No, we have food in here. No, they might pee on the floor. Whatever their excuse is, um, we know it's not a valid excuse, but we're more likely to get it in those types of situations. So guess it's kind of be prepared, which is what we'll go over next week. Does anybody else have any um, samples or ideas for buildings where maybe they might have more, you might have more access challenges? I see wheels spinning. Lulu, do you have um, one? So I'm not sure if this would make sense, but when I visit my friends on bases, uh, I have to let their someone in their command know beforehand. Um, and if you don't, you might have a lot of access issues getting there because they're a government facility. I think that's what they're considered. Yep, federal um, against different rules. And then and there's a building here are called ahead of the... Time can save you a world of pain. Oh, yeah. There's a building here called the DMV. So we have two technical DMVs. One's the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, which is state-owned. And then the actual Department of Motor Vehicles is government-owned. And it, it says on their door that only organization dogs are allowed in but they've allowed me to bring Izzy in when I called ahead of time and said hey I'm coming to schedule something and I have a service dog she's owner trained but she's very well behaved we had a worker meet us outside they basically just looked at her and watched her reactions to things and then they just said okay you can come in yeah that that's kind of borderline um would violate laws, even most federal laws that I know besides the ADA, but like federal building laws, is they're not supposed to um, scrutinize based on dog reactions or require paperwork for the dog to come in as far as like from a training facility. Now, a lot of them, especially like the VA, they may have their own internal paperwork that needs to be filled out beforehand and that they can do and require. But they're not supposed to require proof of training as far as like training certificates and things from trainers or somebody, an organization saying, yes, this is a service dog. But they don't always know oh. their class. <laughs> oh, I just thought it was the same because for a lot of bases, they won't let you into the base stores without the dog being from an organization that the base approves of. So I just thought it was all the same. But now that I know, <laughs> I did not know that it was different for the federal building. 
Yep. Federal buildings have anything. laws and a lot of the stores, I don't know exactly how the stores get away with it there, but I have heard multiple access issues with people taking their service dogs into stores. I do have a couple of connections with some veterans that have dealt with this and could probably find access to links and the laws that actually go. And like you said, those are federal, so they don't change from town to town to town. It's a base specific, you know, all Army have this law, all Marine Corps have this law. So they may differ a little bit from the branches, but every store in that branch should be following the same rules. But I've heard that on bases, stores are an issue. Yeah, I've never personally had an issue on base. Izzy's been to a few of them and they've never given us issues. But I've seen in the community a lot of people who live on base because their dog is owner trained, they can't get into the stores. And I'm sitting there like, what? What do you mean? And I think a lot of that is because those dogs may not be trained well enough to do it and the stores have had to deal with it for so long. You know, um, a lot of bases also allow emotional support animals. And I don't know that they really understand the big difference as far as training wise. <laughs> so, yeah, I have heard lots and lots of horror stories of, of stores on bases and even just getting out of the base in general. So, yep. any oh, other places? There's another place, the Marine Corps Ball. That place, if you're going there, you want to call months ahead of time. Because if they don't approve you, it takes months for them to do all the paperwork. If they don't approve you, you probably won't be able to show up with your service dog. Right. Uh, and that deals with bases, but it's also very important to know that, like, sometimes there is that process, and if that process takes months, you best be prepared. Oh, yeah, I had to contact them. Oh, sorry, Lulu, six go ahead. Months. Oh, you're good. I had to contact them six months in advance, and they had to let the people who were organizing the ball know, so they would be able to figure out what tables we're going to have to sit at how many people will be able to sit at that table. Um, most of the basic stuff they want to know was how big the dog is, the dog's weight, the breed of the dog. Uh, just make sure you have all your ducks in a row if you ever plan on going to one of those events. And it is invitation only, so I think they can like not they allow- They definitely can, they're federal property. They can tell you no, you don't have okay. permission. I've heard, that sure. thing. I've heard that same thing, like, if you're attending, like, a basic training graduation type thing, it can take months to get that approved as well, unless your dog has already been approved to be on base previously. If you've had your dog on base previously, it's supposed to be an easier thing, but there's paperwork yes. that you have to do to get it approved before the day of the event. They won't approve anybody the day of. That is very true. Uh, Izzy's been to, I think, two graduations and two Marine Corps balls and an Army ball. <sighs> They're different. She's experienced. Oh, yeah. I don't think Tofu will be going to any balls, but if anyone ever needs help, yeah, just make sure you get your ducks in a row. Uh, whoever you're married to or dating they need to tell their command before and then they'll get a hold of you and you just have to give them all the information you want um the ball i went to with izzy they did request that she wore a red uh service dog vest of some type just to say that she's a service dog because they don't allow esas apparently <laughs> right so somewhere there, they thought red meant service dogs and ESAs couldn't wear a red vest. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'll wear one on her. All right. And then the second ball, Izzy had to actually wear a gold vest. Um, I think they just were going according to the theme of whatever they were doing there. 
Because gotcha. they had requested I got a gold vest or harness. Well, she went with a pink harness. <laughs> oh, I just wrapped it in gold, whatever. <laughs> I couldn't afford another There's yellow gold there. Or at least I went with the theme. The for every event can add up, so... <sighs> Right. So just keep in mind for those type of events about all of that stuff. Right. Greta, do you have any places where you can think of where it might be more likely challenge for access? Um, I like to go watch wrestling, so I would probably say that would be one that I don't know that I would ever take Cassie to. Yeah, it might depend on, you know, if you can do some practice around maybe some high school wrestling to begin with. Mm -hmm. I have another client whose daughter, believe it or not, <laughs> is a wrestler and absolutely loves it. And she's only in junior high right now. But so when, especially when it's a family member of yours that your dog knows really well, and then they're amping up for wrestling you know they're excited they're actually wrestling <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> that can scare our dogs or make our dogs want to go join in because they think they're playing or yeah. you know, all kinds of different responses so my advice was don't take the dog to a wrestling <laughs> match but if you can do five minutes here and there to practices you know, and condition the dog and get them used to it, slowly building up, you may one day be able to do wrestling matches. And then maybe. you know, get them used to your local high school match. Then you could maybe bump up to a college match. If you could get them used to that, you know, then <laughs> I actually have another client who thought she was going into a small wrestling match and there ended up to be thousands and thousands of people there. She was like, oh, man, my dog was not ready for that. He did good, but I was not ready for that. <laughs> yeah. So you're not the only one that likes wrestling, and it has considered <laughs> whether that's appropriate for your dog or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of times those types of events also do do more around the holidays. So maybe we've had them to a lot of the earlier events and then all of a sudden they have something special and maybe the marching band that normally isn't at wrestling because that goes more with football but maybe all of a sudden it's at their Christmas wrestling match or whatever you know anything unusual like that that maybe our dogs aren't prepared for it's something to consider I know when Heather was in band they did a glow in the dark show once a year too and that would, like, it didn't really happen during the holidays. But that would be something that if your dog was used to going and seeing the marching band perform all the time, that particular show may be something that you wanted to use a little more caution with just because the lights in the facility were off. It does bring one more point that I forgot earlier in the very beginning um, with desensitization. And that is, for many of us, nighttime falls much much earlier so like for me by 4 30 it's starting to get dark and by 5 30 it is dark and azul is fairly conditioned to going out and play it in the dark but i have had a lot of other board and trained dogs and friends dogs and whatever and you know what my one friend has a medical reason she doesn't go out after dark because lights trigger seizures her dog doesn't go out after dark, you know, that one makes sense. But I think a lot of handlers just forget to condition their dogs to being out after dark. And if you follow me, you probably saw that I did a glow walk around Halloween and I'll have another like Christmas lights walk coming up in December. And that's just really important, especially with our young service dogs in training, is that we take them out on work experiences and play experiences after dark so and by that I mean you know if we want to go to a Christmas tree lighting ceremony and we've never had our dog out after dark before they're more likely to be fearful and not know what's going on but if we can take a walk or two outside 
in that area where the Christmas tree ceremony is going to be, but you know, weeks beforehand, then we can help get them conditioned to what they might see and hear in that environment besides the crowds of people that are there. So I always suggest that teams at least a few times a year do an evening walk and the winter is really a good time to do that when it gets dark so early. And especially in my area when we have too much snow to walk on our lot of local trails, the city sidewalks are usually plowed pretty good. So we can walk downtown areas, which is well lit up safely after dark. So we try to do that a lot. And thankfully Azul has done that since he was a puppy and he doesn't have any problems. But just something to watch out for is those types of things as far as is your dog needs to be out after dark when they can freely sniff and see the extra wildlife that comes out after dark. And then also working up to when they're in a crowd after dark. Does anybody else have anything they want to add before I stop the recording? Lou? Um, I don't know if this is a thing, but I'm going to try it with Tofu. I don't know how he's going to do, but it's a parade of lights, and it's when they bring Mr. and Mrs. Claus by horse-drawn carriage to light the big tree. He's never seen horses before except for the mini horses at the fair. He did okay with those ones, but he's never seen a big horse. And he may equate that to the ox at the fair. It was ox, right? That's, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of because they do use the Budweiser horses. And those are big. My advice would be have an exit strategy. So like when I'm doing a fair or a parade, with my dog, I like to be on a street corner so that when the band comes, because there's extra vibrations there, when something like horses come, I can just back off down that side road as far as I need to be for my dog to be comfortable. I, mean, I had Cam at a parade once, and we were already working basically a block away because he's Cam and nervous around people, right? So we were a block away, and then they happened to shoot the guns off right as they were crossing the block, you know, the flag patrol, or whatever you want to call them, shot their guns off right when they hit our block, which of course scared Cameron, and we were able to back up another block away and regain calm, just enough calm to like call it a day and head back to the car and get out of there. So I always want an exit strategy. I want to park in a way that I can get out even during the parade. You know, some roads are closed. So you want to park on the side of town that you want to go to when you're done so you don't have to cross the parade route. <laughs> and Thankfully, it's going by my apartment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? Thankfully, the parade's going by my apartment so I can probably just walk back in the house. Right, you have that one. That's Absolutely. nice too when you can just get um, back into a seat. Do you think I should zone. bring? Yeah, do you think I should bring Izzy? Because he finds a lot of comfort in Izzy. And he'll like, he basically just looks at her before reacting to anything else. But I don't know if it would. Ugh. So if you were driving to a parade and managing two dogs was extremely challenging, I would say probably don't do one dog at a time so you can focus on that dog. Since it's right at your house and you have the ability to stick Izzy back in the house anytime you need to, you know, especially having her there when the scary horses come by could really help him. So oh yeah, she loves horses. Manageable. Well, I'm thinking where she's not afraid of horses because she's been to farms and all kinds of places and she loves horses. She'll like go up to them, lick them. Um, I'm thinking if she's there and she doesn't react in a scared way, maybe Tofu will be okay? I don't and know. <laughs> that's very true. I mean, our dogs do, especially when they're bonded to another dog, which is why I've used Azul with so many friends and their dogs to help get past fears is the dogs will take confidence from another dog and think, oh, well, if they're okay, I'm okay. 
you know, and they will trust it and bond with that. So as long as you're in a situation where you can manage both dogs, and like you said, you can step back inside if you need to. It's not a, if you have both dogs out, you're stuck with both of them for the whole hour, no matter what happens, because you can't leave. So that's always kind of my goal is to have my car close enough that I can access and have an exit strategy. And as long as you do that, you know, there's there's been a lot of times where I've had two dogs at an event like that, and maybe I was managing both dogs, or maybe a family member had one dog or a friend or something had the other dog. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. And having your house right there makes it even easier. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be bringing out a chair and just sitting there and watching mm -hmm. them go by. But uh, I was wondering if that might help. I'm going to try it and I'll let you know how mm -hmm. that works out. I'm hoping you'll help him because at the fair, one of the days when I was able to bring Izzy, he wasn't even afraid of the rides. He looked at Izzy, just walked right by them. And right. that's because Izzy's just like, oh, it's just the fair. Tofu and it, Katsumi. I almost yelled Izzy. Sorry. <laughs> My cat is going after Tofu's butt through the gate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. that. That fluffy, fluffy hairball. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. She, she just attacks his butt all the time. Just his butt. Yeah, because there's no teeth on that end. <laughs> and she's doing it again. Anything else to add as far as holiday things they're thinking about taking their dog to or wondering or places of challenge? Mm -mm. All right. With that, we will wrap up this holiday edition of the Service Dog Handler Chat. Thank you guys for coming.